For you, the listeners of My JavaScript Story, Loot Crate is offering an opportunity to save 10% on any new subscription at LootCrate.com. Just enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Loot Crate is one of my favorite things. Every month I get a box in the mail, costs less than $20, and it comes with all kinds of goodies. I have stuff from just looking at my shelf, Batman, Spider-Man, Ninja Turtles, Back to the Future, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and much, much more. So if you're a geek, a gamer, anything like that, and you want cool stuff to put around your office, cool t-shirts, comic books, etc., then definitely check out Loot Crate. To save 10% on your new subscription, go to lootcrate.com slash ruby. Again, that's lootcrate.com slash ruby to save 10% on any new subscription. Enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another My JavaScript Story. This week, we're talking to Henrik Juratag. Henrik, do you want to say hi? How's it going? Now, we had you on episode 137 of JavaScript Jabber, which was, boy, like three and a half years ago. Yeah, years that ago. was quite some time ago, indeed. Yeah, we talked to you about And Yet. Mm-hmm. And, uh, probably some WebRTC stuff or something. I forget oh, probably. exactly. <laughs> yeah, all kinds of stuff. Anyway... We're going to kind of dig into your story, where you are, what you were doing, what you're working on these days, that kind of thing. Sounds good. I, I kind of want to get started uh, really briefly with, since we talked about and yet, do you want to just kind of fill people in with where that's at these days? Well, so I'm actually not there anymore as okay. of a few years ago. I um, kind of went independent and struck out on my own to just kind of do independent consulting and to uh, work on some of my own projects. So. For the last, you know, few years, I, I did that. I moved to Spokane, Washington. So, yeah, been enjoying that. It's been going well. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and dig into your story, and let's go back to when you got into programming. How did you get sure. into programming? So, yeah, I'm not one of these guys that kind of uh, started doing it when he was like eight. I liked computers, but I had this kind of a high-level interest. And it wasn't until actually after college that I really got into programming at all. I uh, studied business in college. And, you know, I kind of had all these entrepreneurial thoughts and, and all the interesting business ideas I could come up with all had mm -hmm. to do with web related products. So I, I actually started the company, this, this company called House Flicks. And what we did were like early online uh, video tours for houses that were for sale. Oh, cool. So we came up with this whole system for like very quickly creating a video of a house. And but the point is, I, I needed this whole like web app to manage the whole thing for me. And I really didn't have any money to hire somebody good to do it. I did hire somebody, um, but, uh, you know, it never happened quite as quickly as I wanted. It was kind of a side gig for this person. And eventually I was like, well, how hard could this be? Um, uh, maybe I could learn how to do it. And so I just kind of dug in and started teaching myself how to do stuff. <laughs> yep. Awesome. I mean, at the time, that was actually Cold Fusion, which is, uh, you know, <laughs> these days, I don't know if anybody really uses Cold Fusion for anything serious, but uh, I mean, maybe they do. I mean, it doesn't really matter what it is. You know, you still kind of learn the basic programming concepts and I was able to build the app that I wanted. So it was, uh, it was a good start, I guess. Huh. Nice. I've had a few people actually uh, come to me and talk about doing a, a Cold Fusion related podcast. It was just kind of like... Uh, for people who are still doing some form of it. And I was like, oh, well, I didn't know people still did it. But Yeah, I mean, I shouldn't, I shouldn't dog on it. I mean, the, the technologies are good for certain things, and I, it was actually very effective what I, for what I was doing. Yeah, I mean, if it works, time, right? So. Yeah, exactly. Well, so. and uh, a lot of the things that we build have life beyond what we, you know, when we work on it, so. Yes, indeed. So anyway, so you, you, you get in there, you're building this app, was that when you got into JavaScript as well? I was kind of exposed to JavaScript that way because there were things that I wanted it to do that I couldn't always do, like, uh, you know, controlling the video playback and all that kind of stuff. And Cold Fusion has these kind of magical tags that will inject JavaScript for you and do certain things. Right. But, you know, after a while, I kind of I wanted to customize things there, too. But I didn't get too deep into the JavaScript side until later. So after about three years of trying to make that work, and we filmed a bunch of houses, we, it was fine, but we just never made enough money to really justify the, the time and effort. Right. So eventually I just kind of dropped it and I sold it to the guy who was actually filming the videos. And I just got a job at Esri, which happened mm -hmm. to be in the town I lived at, which is like a, 
some people, they're a huge company, but not everyone knows about it unless they've been around uh, kind of online mapping stuff. But they're one of these big kind of, what do they call it? I can't even think of the term now. <laughs> but they, like all the cities use them for, you know, where are their pipes and where, yep. you know, where are the fire, forest fires and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it's it's kind of the de facto standard for a lot of that kind of stuff. And so they happened to be in the town I was living and they needed a cold fusion developer. So I got a gig there. And then it was kind of there that I got exposed to more and more JavaScript. And I was kind of asked to do some things involving JavaScript. And I really kind of liked it. So, you know, back then it was all jQuery. And mm -hmm. and at the time, even then, I was really interested in building kind of more app-like experiences. I don't know if you remember JQ Touch. Yes. So that was a framework by, well, built on, built on jQuery by David Kanita, who's kind of a, you know, he's kind of a designer, but also a mm -hmm. developer. And, um, so I took that and I paired it with Django and tried to make kind of a CMS that would produce these apps. And so in order to make that work the way I wanted to, I had to do a ton of JavaScript. And so that's when I really kind of started digging into it and trying to figure it out, figure out how it all worked. <laughs> nice. So, uh, so yeah, so jQuery was kind of your first major foray, I guess, into JavaScript. Yeah, definitely. And it's a nice little gateway drug to the whole thing because, you know, yeah. With very little code, you can make interesting things happen on your screen. And then you're like, wait, I can do that? And yeah. it's like mind blown, you know? <laughs> yeah. So uh, you, you kind of get going in this. Um, you know, when we had you on the show, you know, we brought you in to uh, talk about uh, And Yet. And mm -hmm. I think they were talking about like ampersand JS and things like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, what kinds of things have you done with JavaScript that you're particularly proud of? Yeah, I've done a lot. It, uh in terms of what I'm most proud of, though, I don't know. I hope I hope I can kind of help push the web into this more app space, really. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've been wanting to do is really just kind of keep narrowing down on patterns that enable, you know, these really fast loading, very small library applications that will, you know, work offline. And the, the whole thing we can now do with PWAs mm -hmm. was kind of something that I've been personally working towards and kind of promoting the idea of for a very long time. And so kind of seeing that all come to fruition has been really awesome. Uh, really starting to see that take off is super fun. But yeah, I mean, I did I did a few things. I wrote a book called Human JavaScript uh, that sold pretty well back in the day. That was all about kind of patterns and stuff. Right. Um, I helped cr create Ampersand. And there was a WebRTC library called Simple WebRTC mm -hmm. that I created that uh, kind of took off too. And I think we were the first people to do multi-user video calls between Firefox and Chrome, as far as I'm aware. There were people, they had a demo one that was doing like a direct one-on-one -on -one conversation, but I think we were the first people to pull it off with, with uh, you know, multiple users in between multiple browsers. Right. So that was kind of fun. And then just to wrap that in an API that people could use, people used that for all sorts of interesting things since then. It was really fascinating. Somebody used it to control a, uh, to basically share a super high power microscope oh. over the internet at a university so that you could control it remotely and then see the result on your screen. And that was all based on simple web RTC. So I was like, Hey, that's pretty sweet. So I don't know, lots of fun little things, you know, I've given talks and whatnot, but, uh, just really trying to promote, you know, the web as an application platform and, at this point, the thing I think people, I hope people will know me for is, is the, the book that I'm writing right now, actually. So uh -huh. trying to kind of wrap up all my learnings into a book that's primarily focused around Redux. So, so yeah, I don't know. <laughs> There's a few things. Cool. Well, I was going to ask what you're working on now. So why don't you talk about the book and anything else you've got going on? Sure. So in about, I don't know, in September this year, I just finished working with Starbucks. So I helped them kind of turn their kind of replatform all their existing .NET code to to using React and Redux. And uh, ultimately, I was prototyping this. I was kind of begged them to let me prototype this little PWA version of a new interface. And uh, they they agreed. And so kind of went off in the corner and, and did that for a bit. And now that's actually what's what's uh, powering the, the entire sign in experience when you sign in as a rewards member to Starbucks.com. So, you know, it, as part of that process, we were forced to tackle a lot of really interesting challenges with Redux and React and large teams 
and a bunch of interesting patterns that we discovered as a result of that, uh, you know, th things that I prototyped and then ended up working really well at scale. So, you know, when I finished that in September, I was like, hey, I should, you know, I should kind of package up all these learnings into another book. And, and so that's kind of what I've been working on. Hopefully that will be done here in another month or two. But, yeah, that's that's one thing I've been doing. Obviously, I'm still doing some consulting independently. So I have people that show up and want to, you know, either get architecture consulting or actually have me write some code for them. But uh, a lot of times, you know, I, I prefer to work with teams that are where they have a team internally and they just need some guidance on how to go about building a PWA and how to right. structure things. And so that kind of consulting has, has been enjoyable for me, too. But I don't know. There's lots of things. In addition to all this, I'm actually I've actually started a my own little donation platform online. So for nonprofits that want to take donations from credit cards from people's phones, I have a system that basically uh, generates a PWA for their organization. So instead of just having a single PWA, it uh, lets them essentially configure a PWA that people can then use to uh -huh. donate. So, you know, they get a subdomain and then they people can pull out their phone, type in a URL and then give with Apple Pay or Google Pay or what have you. And so this is a project I've kind of been working on on my own and um, finally built out to the point where like people can actually go sign up for it online now. So and that's at speedy.gift is, is where that's at. The dot gift is the domain there. <laughs> nice. uh, but it's kind of cool. That's been a really interesting project, too. I've been able to kind of take a lot of the things that I've learned over the years and apply it to because it kind of mixes a bunch of things like because it's, it's all real time. So anytime anything changes in the entire application, it gets pushed to the connected clients. So mm -hmm. if you can literally sit there in the admin interface of this thing and as you're uploading a logo or as you're adding a new fundraising project or changing the description or what have you, you can just look at it on your phone and it will just update in front of you like you're designing the thing. And of course, when anybody gives, you know, you kind of see progress toward, you know, those goals uh, move in real time. So, you know, it's pretty interesting to then throw that up. If you have like a live fundraising event, it's been pretty effective to put that up on a big projector screen, for example. And then, uh, you know, as people give, they see, you know, they see progress towards this shared goal of raising so much money or whatever. So that's that's kind of a product that I've built and has started started growing. And I'm just kind of seeing some consistent steady growth there. You know, the, the hope is that over time that becomes something that uh, provides ongoing revenue for me. But for now, it's just kind of a, a really cool tool. <laughs> so I've been, I've been enjoying that too. I think so far we've only raised, I think we've raised like $70,000 through it total, which, mm -hmm. you know, is nothing to write home about, but it, it's also not nothing. So right. it's kind of, fun. yeah, that's exciting. Yeah. So lots of things. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, it's always interesting to see what gets people excited. So, right. You know, and it, Another area that I, I don't know if you've seen any of the stuff I've done with uh, with the Redux Bundler, but essentially that's a little tool that I've written for organizing Redux applications. Mm -hmm. And just yesterday, actually, I shared an example of, you know, basically if you if you structure your app a certain way, uh, you can just decide to run it in a worker. And I've kind of experimented with this kind of stuff in the past, but typically any app that you build that uh, gets you know, that, that you're trying to run inside of a worker context, you typically have to change a bunch of stuff and do a bunch of crazy mm -hmm. hacks to make it all work. And so the nice thing here is, and the thing that I think is different and unique about this is that it's not actually, you don't really have to change much of anything. So if you build your app the way that I build apps anyway, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can just kind of opt to run them in a worker which is uh, which is pretty neat. Um, so the uh, the main thread does the actual component tree and runs Preact, right? But then uh, all your Redux code and all the kind of reactions to the state and all your action dispatches and everything, all that stuff and data fetching, um, caching, all that stuff gets handled inside the worker. So you know, to give you a bit of an idea, the the main bundle that runs on the UI thread I think is six kilobytes of code, which is hardly anything um mm -hmm. and then you know it's about twice that for the the stuff that runs in the bundle or in the worker so right. and again that's you know, i don't know that's just that's just other kind of fun side effects of of trying to build you know kind of well architected stuff and i just kind of noticed that you would be able to fairly easily just switch this into a running in a worker because it wasn't mm -hmm. 
you know, directly manipulating Dom inside any of that stuff. So I was like, hmm, maybe we should try this. So that's been another kind of fun thing that I've, I've worked on. And that's also how we've, you know, how I have built Speedy and, and how I'm actually deploying this stuff. Not not running in a worker, actually, but, uh, you know, using all the same techniques. So in theory, I could switch it over to run in a worker if I wanted to. Right. We should get you on the React podcast to talk about that stuff. Yeah, sure. Sure. Awesome. Yeah. It's a little weird. I feel like I'm just talking about myself the whole time. I want to ask you all kinds of questions here. <laughs> that's, that's the idea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, yeah, what what cool stuff is going on in your world? And, you know, at the same time, it also kind of highlights your journey. And I think I think some people get this idea that the the people who are out there contributing to the community, the kinds of people we get on JavaScript Jabber are these uber special people. And oh, they, they I don't do, believe that. You know, they, they do terrific work, but I kind of want to highlight, too, it's like, look, if if you go out and make some contributions – you know, the, there's there's nothing special about them that enabled them to do that other than that they just went and did it. Absolutely. So. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things where, you, you know, you keep pursuing something and you find patterns that work and you share it and someone might say, hey, that's terrible. Why are you doing that? You should be doing this. And then if that happens, yep. like you just won, like cause now you know what to do and you learn something, you know. Yep. So I think the biggest danger is not putting anything out there because then, then no one has any opportunity to actually – see what you can do or see how you're thinking or, you know, be able to share, I don't know, they, they might find something useful in your ideas. I think that's the way it works. I think you have yep. to kind of engage. If you're just kind of sitting in an office at home by yourself and never publishing anything, then you, no one's going to know who you are, right? Not yep. that that's the goal, but it's just it's just a natural side effect of, of trying to do things and, and share and explore. Yep, absolutely. So the last segment of the show is the picks. Mm -hmm. You have some things you want to shout out about? Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Yeah, I don't know. I think my, my tools of choice right now and some things I'm excited about. So obviously, Preact is a big one for me. I, uh, I love kind of the programming model that React allows, but just to be able to kind of take the essence of that in three kilobytes is just awesome. And, you know, there's a few little API changes that I actually like that are a little bit different. I don't use the compatibility stuff. And so it's just a super lightweight little UI framework for rendering mostly, in my case, functional components. Mm -hmm. So super clean, super easy, works really well, super performant. I haven't had any issues with it. So that's just like, that's been huge for me, uh, which is also why I donate to his uh, open collect thing every month, because I think it's, you know, the kind of thing I want to support. So that would definitely be one. The other thing I'd like to mention is Parcel.js. I've done an awful lot with Webpack over the years, and I've done, you know, kind of every various contortion of <laughs> all these things that you can do in the config. And and the thing that, that has always bothered me slightly is just the amount of time it takes to get it all set up. And I, I know I'm not the first to mention this, obviously, but nope. and things have gotten a lot better over the years. However, I think... The, the concept of what Parcel is trying to do is is just magic. I mean, the, the idea of, of, for one, starting with an HTML file is brilliant. You know, the HTML part of, of uh, Webpack has always kind of felt like a bit of a tack-on sort of thing. You know, ultimately, you have to figure out what these file names are and make sure they show up in your HTML mm -hmm. file, right? And Parcel kind of flips that on its head and say you, your entry point becomes your HTML file, which I think is 
Brilliant. And then it, you know, kicks out an, a fully populated HTML file. So it kind of does the templating of that for you. And, but it lets you maintain that control of, you know, if you want to add a meta tag or whatever, you just do it on the input version, but then it will go and parse that and it will grab and build whatever it needs to be built based on that. So that's, that's been like hugely awesome. It's still fairly early in that project. I mean, there's a few little bugs and things that bother me. For example, they don't yet do tree shaking, but I think that stuff's just a matter of time. I think the, the basic model is really sound and the super fast bundling times, especially during development is just really sweet. So huge props to Devin Govett for that. And for, you know, hopefully that keeps, keeps becoming more and more awesome. So that would be definitely another one. Nice. We've been trying to line up a JavaScript Jabber episode on Parcel. So, yeah, no, it's it's sweet. It's really great. Another one that I think is kind of an an unsung hero, and it kind of gets some attention these days. But I think Rollup is 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 also mm-hmm. similarly awesome. Um, I've actually used that quite a bit as well instead of Webpack for various projects. And, you know, primarily it's kind of pitched as a, as a tool for libraries, but there's nothing stopping you from using it for applications as well. And I've, if I've done that a decent amount, uh, I like the, uh, the cool thing about Rollup is you can just kind of give it multiple configs. So instead of passing it a config file that exports an object, you can have export an array of objects and each object is right. in a separate config. And so if you're doing things like what I've been messing with, where you're, trying to essentially split code between a main a main UI thread and a worker, you can just have it two configs and have it build two files. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and you know the name of the worker file that's generated, so then you can just kind of instantiate the worker file from your main file and you're you're good to go, right? You can create the worker that way. Yep. That's been super great for kind of hacking around with worker stuff. And the neat thing about that, too, is if you have a library that's all written ES6 with like ES6 modules and with the tree shaking that comes with Rollup, you kind of get this natural split and deduplication of code because Mm -hmm. if you don't reference it in your main bundle, it's not going to show up in your main bundle. Right. So even if you're pulling pieces from a shared library, you can still end up with distinct separate pieces of that, you know, that only have the relevant portions of code that you actually need for that context, which is, which is pretty sweet. So big fan of that. And just the tree shaking aspect is, is really magical too. In that sense, I, I really, and the the other aspect that I think is underappreciated with Rollup is the fact that it kind of flattens everything out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if you saw any of the numbers for some of the analysis that's been done by some of the folks on the Chrome team about just kind of resolving dependencies in a typical Webpack build. There's an awful lot of overhead in just kind of sorting out the requires, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> and uh, so what, what, what Rollup does that's unique is it kind of flattens that whole structure out. Mm-hmm. So you, which is, you know, that it can have, you can run into some interesting bugs at times, but by and large, that also dramatically speeds up execution of your code, which is really awesome. So I've been, I've been really impressed with Rollup as a result. So that's another one that I would throw out there. Very cool. I just, I, something I've been messing around with is not necessarily programming, but is kind of related to knowledge work in general is this whole idea of uh, spaced repetition systems. Have you done anything with this? Uh-uh. Have you heard that term? Uh-uh. So the basic gist is that, you know, we have the way our brains work is there's like an optimal interval where we should be exposed to something again in order to remember it in the long term. Okay. So there's research about this that, that says, you know, there, there's these kind of known intervals that if something is really easy, you know, it might need you might need to see it again in 10 days to for it to stick. And over time, as things get easier, you can stretch that interval out and, you know, is basically flashcards, right? But but flashcards with brains behind it. So the interesting thing is, over time, you kind of create this library of flashcards in this software. There's a there's software that does this for you. Uh, the one I use is called Anki, A N K I. But the neat thing is, like you, the stuff that you put in there will end up in your brain as long as you review your cards for that day, right? right. Like if you keep staying on top of whatever reviewing whatever cards are due at the time uh-huh. um, based on when you last saw things and whether how difficult it was to recall the answer or if you got it wrong. <laughs> so it will kind of adjust for you when it thinks you need to see it again. And I don't know, it's just something I've really enjoyed getting into recently. And I think it's something that's really powerful for, for knowledge workers. There's a lot of things that we have to, you know, that we could benefit from committing to memory. 
And um, this essentially lets you pick what you're going to remember, which is really powerful. So for what it's worth, that's been cool. I, I recommend trying that out and experimenting with it if you haven't. That sounds really interesting. And I have a number of things that I'm trying to learn, and it's not all technical either. So, Right, absolutely. I, I do yeah. random like history facts and like, you know, dates from important events and just – Oh, just yeah. stuff that I want to remember, you know, in vocabulary. It's great for vocabulary. If you come across yeah. some new word in an article that you don't know and you stop for two seconds to throw it in a card, then next time you come across that word, you know you're going to know what it means, right? Yep. So that's that's been cool. Yeah, I bought the Pimsleur system for learning languages. Um, hmm. I bought their thing for Japanese. Oh, right on. And so, you know, I, I think that might be interesting to you know, to drill myself on that stuff. Yeah. And they do have ways to kind of import collections of cards that other people uh -huh. have made. So, you know, if you wanted to do Spanish vocab or something like you, you, there's yeah. collections out there you can drop in, but the yeah. concept I think is really interesting. Yeah. The other thing that appeals to me, you know, on the language front too, is I speak fluent Italian, but my, nice. my vocabulary is pretty limited to a couple of very specific topics. Sure. I went to Italy as a missionary. So oh, right I, I speak Italian and I can talk about religion, you know, all day long. Yeah. <laughs> I have all that vocabulary. Right. But, you know, I talk to other programmers and we have to switch back to English because I just don't have it. And so I do that, the exact same thing in Swedish. You know, yeah. I, I someone will figure out that I'm Swedish at a conference and they'll start talking Swedish. And it's fine until they go technical. And all of a sudden I'm like, well, I no, we're going to have yeah. to do English. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I have to explain to him. No, I was a missionary there. And so I can talk to you about getting around town and I can talk to, you know, all, all the right. living there stuff and all of the religious stuff, but anything else I don't have the vocabulary for. Yeah, I hear you. Yep. Anyway, I'm going to jump in here with a few picks. So I'm, I'm really into board games. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my wife is into board games. It's funny because for our birthdays, we tend to buy each other board games. And so nice. <laughs> uh, her birthday was this last week. And I bought her the Harry Potter Hogwarts Battles, uh, which okay. is a collaborative deck building game. Nice. And uh, it's it's really, really fun. If you're a fan of Harry Potter, it kind of adds that flavor to it. But honestly, it's just a fun game to try and figure out how to, um, you know, defeat all the villains before they, you know, defeat you, I guess. So anyway, nice. um, I'm going to pick that. And then the other thing that I'm going to pick, I've been working on some stuff uh, regarding the website and uh, also regarding uh, some courses. So I'm going to pick some things around that. Uh, first of all, this episode is going to come out way after uh, React Dev Summit, but we did talk about React. So if you're interested in React Dev Summit, it was in March. You can still get the videos. You have to pay for them until about six months after the conference. And then what happens is I start releasing them publicly to build publicity for the next one is nice. basically the way that works. So if you want them now and you don't want to wait another three or four months, you know, when this comes out, then definitely check that out, reactdevsummit.com. Same thing with JavaScript, JS Dev Summit. Uh, this should come out right around when that's being held. You might have missed it by a week. I need to go check my schedule. I just don't remember the exact dates on this. But that's going to be held May 14th through the 18th. So definitely check that out as well. Uh, we're going to have a whole bunch of speakers come and talk to us about JavaScript. And uh, anyway, so so those are coming up. And then on the website, I had a custom... WordPress theme built. And the more I've used it, the more I've found limitations in what I want to do with it. And since it's custom, I have to go in and actually code in PHP um, mm. to, to make it do what it has to do, which is kind of a fun departure from what I typically do because I'm usually doing Rails or Angular or React. But the flip side of that is, is that sometimes it's a pain to figure out this stuff. So I'm going to be switching to a new theme and it is the newspaper theme. I got it on Theme Forest. So you can definitely go check that out as well. Pretty happy with it so far. Um, I've just been playing with it on my staging server. And so we'll, we'll go fiddle with that and then see what happens. But anyway, so yeah, so that's all the stuff that, that I've been playing with lately. Right on. Um, on the courses, the how to get a job course is pretty much finalized at this point as we're talking the next course I'm going to do is automating your development processes. And so we're going to be pulling in tools and showing you how to set up CI and continuous deployment and all that stuff so nice. that, yeah, all this stuff just kind of magically happens. You don't have to spend a ton of time really worrying about it. 
because I find a lot of people wind up doing a lot of this stuff manually and they don't like doing it anyway. And so it's, okay, well, why do I spend all this time on this thing that I don't really love, you know, instead of writing code and doing the stuff that we do love. So. Right. Totally. Anyway, on that, on that end, I think uh, Cypress is pretty amazing too. Have you yeah. used Cypress at all? Yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. I'm a huge fan of that. So I've been using for end-to-end testing. It's phenomenal. So. Yeah, we've had Gleb Bomatov on Adventures in yeah, yeah. and Ruby, or not Ruby Rogues, JavaScript Jabber to talk yeah, about yeah. it. So. Nice. Yeah, that, that guy is a phenomenal developer. He's, he's awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, um, if people want to see what you're working on, they want to keep up with you. Do you have a blog or a Twitter? Yeah, I do, or a I do have a blog and Twitter. Uh, I mean, I'm uh, yourteg.com is is my blog. J O R E T E G. My Twitter handle and GitHub handle is just my full name, so it's Henrik Jorteg. Uh, so H E N R I K J O R E T E G. But yeah, it's uh, I uh, most everything new and interesting I do ends up showing up on Twitter somehow. So that's the best way to keep up with what I'm working on. But yeah, thank you. (laughs) Awesome. Well, thanks for coming. I'll get you the links to get you on uh, React Roundup. Sounds good. uh, We'll catch everybody next week. All right. Thanks so much. See you later. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.